tonight in the Old Testament. And let me let me start it this way. All right. And because and the reason why I'll share share with you why I'm going to start it this way in a bit. All right. Got a couple of books in here. A couple of good Christian books. Okay. And it's group participation time. Okay. The five languages of love. How many of you read this book? All right. Okay. Wild at heart. How many of you read this? Okay. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. All right. Now, what about this book? The Book of Nahum. See a show of hands. Amazing. As I began teaching this book on the North Shore Bible study on Monday nights, people ask me, hey Dave, what are you teaching on Monday nights? I go to the Book of Nahum. They go, what is that? I go, dude, that's a book in the Bible. It's a three-chapter book. It's one of the minor prophets. And it had been amazing me, the response that I get from people. Who go, I never knew that was in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with these guys. Like I said, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. But I can guarantee you this. If you take these three chapters, and you take one stack of good Christian books, I'm not talking about the Joe Osteen stuff, I'm talking good Christian books, <laughs> this high, it cannot compare to three chapters of the book of God. It is the book of Nahum by God. <laughs> And I get calls and things all the time from people. Dave, hey man, I got this going on in my life. I got this going on. How do I do this? And I've learned in my own life, the more I know my God, the less I have to struggle with issues. You know what, gang? The same God that we were singing to, that we just prayed to, that we are here to worship is the same God who split the Red Sea. It's the same God. But my question to us tonight, and I said us, including me, how well do we know Him? How well do we know Him? The Bible speaks much of this issue of knowing our God. I got a few verses that are going to be thrown up there. But one of the categories about knowing our God because of the lack of knowledge of who God is judgment comes upon the earth listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 30, um, 34 become sober minded as you ought and stop sinning for some have no knowledge of God I speak this to your shame 1 Samuel 2 3 boast no more so very proudly do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with Him actions are weighed. Hosea 4.1 Listen to the Lord, um, listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. My people, Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you from being my, my priests. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. There's prophecies of the Bible that the knowledge of God will increase on the face of the earth one day. And I believe this prophecy speaks specifically during the thousand year reign of Jesus from Mount Zion. This is from Isaiah 1, um, 1 9. They will not hurt or destroy all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. But this last category. God desires this for His children. He desires that we know Him more and more. I ask people this all the time when I'm discipling them. I say, give me your definition of eternal life. And they 
whatever, randomly. Oh, I'm going to live forever with God. I'm going to be in heaven. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more death. I go right on. That's part of it. But Jesus says in John 17, 3, the high priestly prayer. In John 17, 3, Jesus says, This is eternal life, knowing the one and only true God. The old time preachers used to say, It would take eternity for us to know our God. And I used to think, that's just the preacher came up with that. Jesus came up with that one. So it's going to take eternity for us to know our God. But He wants us to begin now, knowing Him more and more. Listen to this, Proverbs 2, 5. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. How's that? To know this awesome God, this Creator, the King of all kings. God wants that for us. Hosea 6.6 6, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifices and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God desires this for us, to know Him. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This was Paul's desire for the church in Colossae. Starting in verse 9. For this reason also since the day, chapter 1, Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason also since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. See the dot being connected there? The more we increase our knowledge of God, the more we know how to walk. To please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That is God's desire for us. Jump over to chapter 2, starting in verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf for those who are in Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knitted together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mercy, that is Christ in Himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." God wants that for His people. He wants us to know Him as we say, more and more. Do we know our God? Are we seeking Him? Do we seek Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength? Because God promised what? If we did that, what's going to happen? We'll find Him. God makes it simple. Remember, gang, God calls us sheep because why? We're dumb. <laughs> he keeps it simple. He makes it really simple. The term sheep, don't ever think because we're all cute and cuddly. That's not why God's going to use that. And so tonight, tonight, let me begin with this story. I shared this before, but it was a long time ago, and a lot of you might not have heard this story. Early on in my walk as a Christian, Wax realized, Wax realized that God had His hand on me in the area of teaching and ministry. And so he was having a small Bible study on Molokai. And he goes, hey, I want you to share a little bit up there. It's the first time ever. I mean, any time, first time I shared anything publicly about the Lord in actual teaching. It was just real small. And I go, okay. And he goes, okay, I want you to share a little bit on hell. What? <laughs> Well, thanks, her, bro. So I come into the Bible study, sitting down, knew pretty much everybody was there. And this is the way Waxer introduced me. And some of you know that I was on commercial fisherman at that time. I had my boat and everything. And I'm sitting there, and you gotta remember, I've only been walking with the Lord maybe a year. And Waxer, this is my public introduction by Waxer into ministry. He goes, You know, every now and then God raises up a Jonah in the church. And my mind started going, Jonah, Jonah. Uh, you know, I wasn't that familiar with the Bible. Jonah. Jonah, that's the guy got swallowed by the whale. 
And then my mind started going, wait a minute. I still got my boat. I'm still fishing. Wait now. I can fall off my boat. I'm going to get swallowed up. Barf back out on the west side of Molokai, and I'm going to have to preach, repent Molokai. <laughs> I was just like, okay, right on. But tonight, I don't come as a prophet. I don't come as a prophet, but I bring a message from a prophet. You heard me? I'm not coming and speaking as a prophet, but I'm going to bring a message from a prophet. And that prophet is the prophet Nahum. And we're only going to hit three, oh, excuse me, seven verses here tonight. But what I want us to focus in on is the character of God that Nahum begins to describe in these seven verses. You see, Nahum's purpose, Nahum's prophecy was to the city of Nineveh. Sounds familiar, gang? Who went to Nineveh? There was another prophet that went to Nineveh. Who is that? Jonah. What happened when Jonah went to prophesy at Nineveh? They repented. For a hundred, somewhere between 100 and 150 years, Nineveh was allowed by God's mercy and grace to continue. To continue to, to thrive. Nineveh, uh, the, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. And if you look at any ancient maps of the ancient kingdoms, Assyria was huge. It went up into Turkey and Iraq and Iran and, and Syria, Lebanon, came down through Israel and Jordan and the northern part of Africa and Egypt and all that. This thing was massive. And through the prophet Jonah, God says, I have mercy on you because you heard my call. But now, about 100 to 150 years later, God sends another prophet, and his name is Nahum. And he says, your days are over. It's done. There is no turning back this time. There is an invisible line, gang. Hear me tonight. There is an invisible line with nations and with individuals that if you cross over that line, and only God knows where that line is. There is no turning back. And as we go through tonight's little message, think about the situation we're in as a nation. And the situation that Nineveh was in. As I finish up this chapter last night um, in Kahuku, I was just amazed at the parallels of what was going on in Nineveh and what's going on in America today. And although God's mercy and love and kindness is long-suffering, there is a limit to it. And none of us reach this limit. And tonight, I can go through all the historical facts of none of us. As God saved them within that 100 and 150 years or so, God also used none of us to conquered the northern kingdom, Israel. Remember, after Solomon's reign, Israel split into two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah. And God used the Assyrians to take out the northern kingdom. But then, under this king called Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, he rebelled directly against God. If you finish up this chapter on your own, you see twice where he says that he devised a plan against God. God in Psalms 2 scoffs at these things. He says, who is the nations that devise these things against me? And tonight I can keep going on all these different parallels and historical facts. But what I want us to see tonight, gang, is our God. I made a commitment after I stepped out of ministry a few years ago. And I, I, I made a commitment to the Lord. I said, Lord, if you ever allow me back in, I commit to you that my ministry would be to tell people about who you are. We have so much teaching about us, 
how to be a better Christian, how to be the, the godly father, the godly business person, whatever. But the Bible, I just had a few verses where it says, increase your knowledge of who God is. The byproduct is that you become the godly person. And I've been in ministry long enough to know and see when I minister to people and says, who is your God? And they begin to dig. They begin to dig into the Word of God because in the, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Sometimes instantaneously, I see their lives change. I see them grow. One of my friends just last night was helping her out with some spiritual stuff. I said, hey, just go take this one little verse and dig through the Bible and come up with an interpretation. It's a single verse parable, probably five sentences. She called me this morning. She goes, David, I've never been this high on Jesus ever. Do we know our God? People see me and they go, dude, you're crazy. I go, yeah, crazy about Jesus. Amen. And the more I get to know him, the more crazy I get. And so go to the Old Testament. might take you a little bit of time to find it because some of you never even knew the book of Nahum was in the Bible. Old Testament, minor prophets. Let's pick it up, gang. If you hit Micah, go to your right, you're right there. You guys, anybody need a Bible? We got Bibles. Everybody's good? Gonna have a Bible slide here, gang. What I want us to see tonight is a part of God's character that I think as Christians we tend to shy away from. We know about God's love and mercy and kindness and grace. But do we know about His righteousness? About His judgments that He is serious about? You see, Naum means comfort or comforter. And if you just do a surface read over this book, you can go, okay, how am I going to be comforted by this? This is a question I have for you tonight. How many of you have ever been in a fight for your life? Now what is the purpose in that fight? It's to destroy your enemy at all costs. I've been in those type of physical fights where it's like, it's either you or me, brother. And when you understand this as a Christian, that there is a battle going on day in, day out for the souls of men. And the loser gets eternal damnation. And the winner gets eternal salvation. You find comfort in this. Because you see the mighty hand of God dealing with our enemy. Every one of us in here have one common enemy and his name is Satan. And God will deal with him one day. And so tonight, bear with me because it might be some things like, Oh, brah, David, you're so heavy. Well, let's just let the Word of God do what the Word of God needs to do in our life. And describe to us who is this righteous and awesome mighty God of ours. Ready? Verse 1. The oracle of Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. Okay. Word oracle or your, some of your versions might say um, burden. Well, the word in the Hebrew mean, um, is, is masa. And what it means is to utter. An utterance. But the root word of masa is nasa. Just like the space agency, N-A-S-A, -A. NASA. That's the root word of Masa. And what it means is to be taken out. How's that one? America thinks they have their space program, and they can send ships up into the air. That word NASA, NASA in the Hebrew, that's the same word that is used when Enoch was taken up. That's the same word that is used in the Hebrew when Elijah was taken up. 
Nasa means to be taken out suddenly. Our Greek word, our English word, rapture. Same thing. And so, here is the burden or the utterance speaking forth in this context of judgment. And who is the judgment on? Nineveh. The city of Nineveh. Now, remember the parallels. Try and in your mind as I describe some of the stuff of Nineveh. Think about what our country is about and what we're going through right now. Nineveh was bloodthirsty, violent. They thrived on war and invasion. They were the first. When, how they, when they fought wars back then, what they would do, if you came in and you conquered another kingdom, and you would go into their capital, they were the first ones to do this. They would take the people out, the native people, and take them and spread them out all over their kingdom. And then they would bring people that they conquered from other places and bring them and put them into that place. Well, when they conquered Israel, the northern kingdom, the capital of Israel was Samaria. Now watch this. Remember, we're looking at the mercies and the, uh, excuse me, the character of our God. And now watch the mercy of God even in this situation. Keep your finger here and go with me to 2 Kings 17. This is incredible. The mercy of our God here. Even upon these people. 2 Kings 17, let's just real quick look in verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria. And settled them in Hala and Habar, the river of Gozan and the cities of the Medes. So they were the first ones to do this. And the reason why they did this was so that there wouldn't be a remnant within that city to begin to rebel. That was their purpose. They would take the people out and move them around. Now watch. Now jump over to the um, same chapter. Go to verse 24. 2 Kings 17, 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kuhath and from Avah and from Hamath and Sepharvaim and settled them in the cities of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel. So they possessed Samaria and lived in the cities. And it came about at the beginning of their living there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria saying, The nations you have carried away into exile in the cities of Samaria do not know the customs of the God. Notice that, small g, don't know who they're talking about. Do not know the customs of God of the land. So he has sent lions among them, and behold, they killed them, because they do not know the customs of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, commanded, saying, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile. Let him go and live there, and let him teach them the customs of God of the land. How's that? God sends the lions and says, Hey, wake up. Then God allows one of the priests, one of the Jewish priests, one of the Israelite priests to go back and teach them to fear God. Now look at how they respond. So one of the priests whom they had carried away into exile from Samaria came to live at Bethel. Bethel means what, gang? House of God. And taught them how they should fear the Lord, Adonai. Verse 29, but every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the houses of the high places which the people of Samaria had made every nation in their city which they lived. We know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in America. But we're making every other God the God of this country. You guys know Last Sunday, what was the proclamation of this nation by Obama? June is declared National Homosexual, Lesbian, Transgender, Transgender Pride Month. 
There is a lying game. We need to wake up. The last recorded sin in Sodom and Gomorrah was not just the act of homosexuality before God destroyed it. It was the okay of homosexuality within Sodom and Gomorrah. God means what He says and says what He means. Some of you sitting here tonight going, bro, get that guy off the stage. He's a bomber. I told you, I'm bringing a message of a prophet. I'm not the prophet. But we can take the parallels from Nineveh and go, whoa. Nineveh rejected God's mercy. Nineveh was mighty, their armies. Listen to the description of the army. The army was the largest standing army ever seen in the Middle East or Mediterranean. The excitement of war caused technological innovations which made the Assyrians almost unbeatable. Iron swords, lances, metal armor, battering rams made them a fearsome foe in battle. Sounds familiar, huh? This wasn't dumb people, gang. This wasn't some backwood tribe that was just bloodthirsty and looking for any way to get into a fight. These were smart people. Listen, some of the things they invented we use today in very high technological areas of our lives. Listen to some of the things they invented. The odd paradox of the Assyrian culture was a dramatic growth in science and mathematics. This can be in part explained by the Assyrians' obsession with war and invasion. Among the great mathematical inventions of the Assyrians were the division of the circle into 360 degrees. Our compass. Math, certain types of math is still based on this. They figured out how to cut up a circle in 360 degrees. And were among the first to invent longitude and latitude in geographical navigation. These were not dumb people. Very smart full of the technology of the day, full of wealth. They were very wealthy because of all the invasion and all the um, plunder and booty they took from the other places. They also developed a sophisticated medical science which greatly influenced medical science as far away as as Greece. Sounds familiar, gang? God means what He says and says what He means. Nail. You know that's, that's all we know about this guy, what is found right there in verse 1? This is all that we know about this prophet, what is said there in verse 1. The book of the vision of Nail, the El Kushite. He was from this place called El Kosh. There are so many of these little areas called El Kosh that nobody knows where this guy came from. All we know, he came from El Kosh, and his name means comforter. That's it. What El Kosh means, it means God ensnares. Now, why am I making such a big point of his name? Naum was a nobody. Think about it. This is all we know of this guy. He was a nobody, but God sent him to the mightiest kingdom of that day and said, you tell him, I'm coming. I'm sitting in a, I'm standing and you guys are sitting in a room of a bunch of nobodies. And God has a message. It may not be this message like a prophet, but God has a message that he wants to use us and says, go tell the world that I am coming. And I am serious about this. He sent Nahum to the greatest kingdom of the day. He used to tell them that their days are numbered. God tells us in 1 Corinthians that what? He takes the foolish things of the world to what? Why do you think I stand in here and you guys sit in there? That word foolish is where we get our English word moron from. It's the truth. He doesn't only call us sheep, he calls us morons. But he loves using us because he loves us. He could send one angel down right now. Come on, 
You tell me if Gabriel cannot preach better than me. You tell me if that's not true. But God says, my grace is sufficient enough. That, that goes for you. God wants to use us to go and tell the message that Jesus loves them. But that Jesus is also a righteous God. He is a just God. Now, we may not know Nahum, but I tell you what. If you take a deep study in this book, Nahum knew his God. Let's pick this back up. Verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. A jealous and avenging God. When was the last time you shared that one about Jesus? Want to hear about my Jesus? He's jealous and avenging. God's word. God describing himself through the prophet Nahum. How many of you married out there? Show of hands. Okay. How many of you have a jealous spouse? <laughs> it's a biblical question, not a trick question. You need to have a jealous spouse if it is a biblical jealousy. You see, this word here that describes God as a jealous God in the Hebrew is kano. And when it is used of God, it means to have no other rival. And you, husband, wife, need to have no other rival. Your eyes, your heart, your mind should be for your wife or your husband alone. This is how God sees us. It is like Waxer always tries to describe this to us about God's jealousy. He's not jealous. Um, um, for himself, but he's jealous for us. He says, don't go there. It will hurt you. Our selfish jealousy, you go, go, girl. You know what? You're hurting me. God says, please don't go there. He says, you belong to me. And as a husband, as a wife, these things are good if there are biblical jealousies. He says, baby, don't go there, please. It'll hurt us. It'll hurt our family. There's nothing wrong with that. Selfish jealousy has nowhere to be in our lives as Christians. People always tell me this. Hey David, I'm Christian, but I'm not on doormat. Really? Who's the biggest doormat in history? Jesus. If there was anybody who could have stopped and took revenge in that moment, it was him. Our God is a jealous and avenging God. From the very beginning with the nation of Israel, if you study the second commandment, God proclaims Himself. He says, You shall have no other gods, no other idols, for I am a jealous God, an avenging God. God describes Himself this way. Why can God be the only one who avenged, gang? Why can only God avenge? Because only God knows the whole scene. We are not allowed to take vengeance. God gives us the standards as His kids about taking vengeance. Keep your finger here in Nahum and go to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, starting in verse 19. Never take your own vengeance, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And here's the standards. This is how we as Christians are to deal with revenge here on earth. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. 
For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but what? Overcome evil with good. God gives us the standard. He says, only he and he alone can take vengeance. That is why he is an avenging God. We cannot. Our responsibility is to love our enemy. Now this might sound racist, but I don't care. Because I live in Hawaii, and I'm tired of the political correctness. I can speak all the pigeon I like. But most of you sitting in this room at one time because of the color of your skin was my enemy. Because you was on Howley. And God used some crazy Howley like waxer to lead me to him and I had to love him. <laughs> and people on Molokai was going, something went wrong with David. <laughs> We're all hanging with the Howleys now. But there is purpose behind that. God says you love your enemy. And hopefully through that, they will see the love of Jesus through you. And if not, then God will deal with them. He is an avenging God. He will deal with this gang. You may have somebody on your back every day at work. And I hear my brothers and sisters come up to me and say, Dave, I don't think I belong there right now because of the way I'm being treated. I go, brother, that's exactly where you belong. Because the, people, the guy is treating you that way because he doesn't know Jesus and he needs to see Jesus in you. So you better start living before him like Jesus. So that that man or woman can be saved. Our Western mentality of Christianity goes, unless it's all good, then God is with me. Pick up the voice of the martyrs. And look at our brothers and sisters in the third world countries who are murdered, raped, jailed, persecuted, like, bring it on so the love of God can be manifested through me to my enemies. God has purpose behind us. And He says, Don't you dare take vengeance, my child. That is not yours. That's my kuliana. Notice something throughout the Bible. When God brings vengeance, there is a byproduct of it from His people, and that is worship. If you go throughout the Bible and you look when God brings down His judgments upon the nations, the enemies against Israel, the byproduct is worship. What happened to, what did the Israelites do after they crossed the Red Sea? God enclosed the Red Sea upon the, um, the Egyptian army. What happened on the other side? Miriam began to lead them in worship. The song of Moses. The rider and the horse have been tossed into the sea, never to be seen again. If you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, a prophecy which is being fulfilled as we sit here right now. And you finish studying that prophecy. In the end, God says, so that the glory of the Lord will be known. You study the book of Revelation. And whenever there are scenes in heaven going on and there's rejoicing and worship and what happened before that God either is about to bring down worship um, his his wrath or he has just brought down his wrath and the people of God rejoice because the enemies have been destroyed this is our God church he is not a namby pamby God he is mighty and awesome he is awesome to save gang What God destroys on earth, you will notice something. What God destroys on earth, man mourns. What God destroys on earth, heaven rejoices. That is throughout Scripture. Just cross-reference on your own time. Study Revelation 18 and 19 and you see that as God destroys the economical system of this world and what happens in heaven as Babylon is destroyed. Our God is avenging and jealous God. Let me share with you guys a quick little story. Then you guys might have heard it from Waxer, but one of our good friends back home on Molokai, this guy named Pulani. This is not the kind of jealousy we are to have in our lives. That's the point to this story. 
They're down in the park at a concert. Amy um, Gilliam is singing. Beautiful woman. So Pulani and his wife is sitting there. And Pulani is just staring at Amy and enjoying the music and everything. And his wife just elbows him and goes, what? You like, kiss him. <laughs> Pulani looks at her and goes, why, Ken? <laughs> that is not what God wants us to be like with our jealousy. Hurt when you see others hurting. That is what the Bible tells us in Romans. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do not have a selfish jealousy, gang. Let's get back into our text. Now watch as Nahum begins to describe this awesome God of ours. Let's begin with the mercy of the Lord. Second part of verse 2. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. That right there, church, should make you go, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that we are saved from the wrath that is to come. Guys, God loves you so much that He saved you from Himself. Think about that. God loved you so much that He saved you from the wrath that is to come, and that is His wrath. Chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, in the same book, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that we are not destined for wrath, but for salvation. This part of God's righteousness, the part of His righteousness where His judgments are derived from, you don't want nothing to do with it. It is good for us to know because it is part of our God, but you praise God that you will never have to face it. He reserves wrath for His enemies. Verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is His way, and the clouds are the dust beneath His feet. Again, we see God's mercy here. Notice it says He's slow to anger. Remember, he gave Nineveh an additional 100 or 150 years. Why did Jonah get mad when God saved them? If you go back and study the book of Jonah, because Jonah knew God's mercy. That's why he got mad, because he knew the mercy of God. Do we? Do we look at our lives and go, man, I should have been taken out a long time ago. But because of your mercy, God, I get to stand here still and praise you. His mercy is, is unbelievable. When you take a serious, serious examination of your life and go, Oh my. And if you here tonight, I don't know all of you in here, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to call out for His mercy. I'll tell you why. Because this same judgment that came down on Nineveh, will come down on individuals also. I'm being straight up and honest with you. You might not like that, but that is the truth because that is what God's Word says. And it, the moment you cry out for God's mercy because you realize you're a sinner, guess what gets poured out upon you? God's grace. And then when God's grace is poured out upon you, guess what happens? Then you have peace with your Maker. It's that simple. Call out for mercy. Say, Lord, have mercy on the sinner that I am. And God will just go, shoots. Pour out His grace and you have peace with your Maker. He is a merciful God, Yang. Notice He is slow to anger and great in power. Again, group participation. How many of you got saved in the last 20 years? Show of hands. How many of you got saved in the last 10 years? Five years? One year? Huh. God is slow to anger, huh? What if He came back 20 years ago? 10 years ago? A year ago? You see this little book, how powerful it is? How it describes our God? Why can God be so slow to anger? Why? Because He's great. 
He has great power. That's what it says. He's slow to anger and great in power. When you're great in power, you ain't got nothing to worry about. You see, our God is patient to save, but He is also patient to judge also. He is great in power. He is slow to anger. This word great, godo in the Hebrew. When it is used in a context, when this word gadol is used in a context of God, what it means is this, gang, hear me. If you hear nothing else tonight, hear this. That word great, it does not mean that God is great because of His power. It does not mean that God is great because of His overwhelming love or His unending, um, um, His mercies that are new every morning. That's not what makes Him great. In this context, the word gadol means that God Himself is great. How great is our God? That's what He's saying. He's saying our God is slow to anger and great in power. He is also righteous. Look at what He says. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now watch this description of His majesty. In whirlwind and storms is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, the blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken up by him. You know what Naom just described? Here comes the judge. You guys remember that? From Flip Wilson? Here comes the judge. In all his might and majesty and power. He describes our God. Not just who he is, but even in his ability to bring judgment in different ways. He speaks of the whirlwind. He speaks of um, um, droughts in verse 4. He speaks of earthquakes. All these things. The might and power and majesty of our God. But look at verse 7, gang. The Lord is what? The Lord is what, gang? Good. When? All the time the Lord is? Good. Now let me ask us, is He? When we turn on the news and we see something so gnarly, can we still stand there like the people are watching Haiti, the Christians down there with dead bodies lying around them, standing in the streets with their hands, praising God, saying, you are right, O oh God. Can we? Is He good all the time? Naomi, I just spent six verses on something that most Christians want to shy away from. And Naomi ends it by saying, God is good. That's why I love the prophets. If you're going to take the time to study the prophets, you better be ready to take your wax. Because you can read and just go, oh, I don't want to read this, this is, oh. And then all of a sudden, it's just out of the blue, poof, God is good. I love it. God is good all the time. Now let's end this thing. A stronghold in a day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an over, overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight. Speaking of Nineveh. And will pursue his men, enemies into darkness. God is good, right? Man has two choices if you look at that verse, those two verses, verse 7 and 8. Man is left with two choices. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You choose. Now the two choices is this. Notice what he says. A stronghold in a day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge where? Not in the things of him, but in him. The only way we know how to take refuge in our God, gang, is by knowing who He is. And then we're not running off to other things. He says, in a day of trouble, take refuge in Him. 
And that's why I see when I minister to people and keep bringing them back to who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is why I see the change in them. Not because of my, look at me, I stumble with words. Not because of me, but because they begin to realize who their God is and they take refuge in Him. And God says, I know you, come in. You see, as man, as humanity, humanity has two choices. You can either run into God and be taken in, or you can run from God and be taken out. That's exactly what verse 8 says. But with an overwhelming flood, He will make a complete end of its sight, and He will pursue His enemies into darkness. Humanity has two choices with this great God of the Bible. You either run to Him and find refuge, or you can run from Him and He will find you. He will take you out. Now tonight, like I said, I don't know everybody in here, and I'm not the kind of pastor to make altar calls. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I love it. I, I, I love the worship and the praise when people do give their lives here on Sunday morning. But that's just not me. One is not right and one is not wrong. It's just the way I believe God has led me to do ministry. But if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior tonight, make peace with Him. Because yes, He loves you. Yes, He died on the cross because of your sins. But because of the rejection of that wonderful work on the cross, He will take vengeance on you. This is straight up, old school, hellfire preaching. Sorry. But that is God's truth. He loves you beyond anything you can understand. The book of Ephesians in chapter 3, Paul says that he wants us to know the height, the width, the depth, the breadth of God's love. But in his very next breath, Paul says that this love is unfathomable. We cannot figure it out. He showed you. He showed you how much he loved you by becoming a man. And going to the cross for you. He cannot show you anymore. The ball is in your court. You choose. Christian. Know your God more. He is so enormous. That it's going to take eternity. To know who he is. Run to him. In a day of trouble. Know him. And when you run in. He says. Come in, my kid. Take refuge in me. Because in him, as Paul told us, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? Barukata Adonai. Eluhenu melehaha olam Yahshua. Yahshua Hamashiach. Barukaba. Baruk Adonai. Baruch HaKodesh Baruch Elohim Father we come tonight as blessed children because of who you are because of the greatness of our God the majesty of our God the might and power the righteousness, the holiness the mercy, the kindness the love of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 